SJA, I'm James with this week's updates. The holidays are just around the corner and we are ready to decorate our church for Christmas. Please join us Monday, November 25th and come by anytime between the hours of 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. and lend a hand. Mark your calendars for Saturday, December 14th as the Greater LA Cathedral Choir will be joining us for our all-church Christmas banquet, sponsored by Laugh. As always, ticket prices are only $6, so please come out to the gazebo and purchase your ticket. You won't want to miss this. There will be no midweek services for Thanksgiving week, Wednesday, November 27th. As well, Saturday evening services will be taking a break for through the holidays and will return January 11th 2014. Christmas will be here before you know it, and to many, that means shopping. Scrip is just a simple way to purchase your holiday gifts for stocking stuffers or even to just help keep you on your budget when you are out shopping for your family and for your friends. With every dollar you spend, a portion of it goes to supporting both our youth and children's ministries. Also, we are offering a buy one, give one, thought to help families in need. Come by the script office to get more information and, if you can, to purchase a gift card that will go a long way into helping a family in need right here at home. Finally, church, please check your connection for any other events, announcements, and important information and take this moment to silent your cell phones. Thank you and Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, that's that was encouraging. Yay. <laughs> you know what? I love the fact that you guys uh, want to say hello and friendly. This section was overly friendly this morning. Just just love it on people today. Didn't hear one announcement though, did they? No. No, not a thing. They didn't hear a thing. All right. Okay, the psalmist says this out of Psalm chapter 5, verse 11 through 12. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them, sing, uh, let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. For surely, O Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. Now, uh, you know, we went through that Blessed Life series, and I've been asking for your stories. And a few weeks ago, I told you the story about a man that often uh, would kind of stalk his parking lot to give out $100 bills in this church parking lot after service. And then in this one particular day, he felt, just felt led to give $120 to a, a particular individual who had taken a step of faith in service that day. So that was the story. Someone writes from this congregation, and I was sitting there one day, and I heard that story, and I leaned over to a friend and said, boy, I sure wish someone would give me $120 today, and she kind of said that in fun and everything else, and I think she probably walked out into the parking lot waiting for someone, but no one gave her $120 in the parking lot, but when she did get home, there was a card, there was a belated birthday card there for her, and it was from her son. Now, first of all, I think I'm adding this. She was probably shocked that her son even remembered. So, hey, praise the Lord right there. That's worth 120 bucks, right? But when she opened the card, there was a check for $125. And she just kind of thought, well, praise the Lord. And folks, I got to tell you that it really is fun serving the Lord. But more so than that, when we really grab a hold that fear can be broken from our lives, that we can trust him with everything, that it changes the whole playing field for us and it allows us to turn that stress into joy and that pressure into a sense of hope that God is our provision in all things. And so I know sometimes we say stuff and fun, but be careful what you whisper to God because he hears you and he knows the motivation of your heart and he wants to take care of you. And so if you're at the end of the aisle, if you'd reach down, grab that bucket, hold on to it for just a moment. We are going to pray together and then we're going to receive our morning tithe offering. And some of you are beginning to make pledges in regards to ruin. And I want to say thank you for that. And uh, so let's pray together. Father, we thank you today for this opportunity to give. Father, we have uh, this opportunity to return back to you, that which is yours, that you, you ask us to be good stewards of, 
And Lord, I know sometimes in that, that, uh, uh, that challenge of managing, we sometimes want to rob Peter to pay Paul, and sometimes you're Peter, Lord. But Lord, I pray that we would continue to remember to put you first in everything, not just with our finances, but your word says, seek first the kingdom of God. And so, Father, as we apply that principle to every aspect of our lives, including our finances, I pray, Lord, that we would just move from fear and into faith and that we would move into a place where we would no longer stress about our finances. And, Lord, as you have done a miraculous thing in this congregation these last several weeks, Lord, I pray not only would it continue, but it would allow us to move and do kingdom good purposes. Your calling for us as a church. We ask this, we pray this, we believe this in Jesus' name today. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. God bless you. You can pass that along the aisles. And uh, just let me bring you up to speed on a couple things real quick. If you brought, um, uh, t- uh, brought food today to help us with some of our families that we're providing Thanksgiving meals for, would you make sure you drop it off in the box area or at the gazebo this morning on your way out? We will be doing that distribution around 2 o'clock this afternoon, so we need to make sure that is all in, so we appreciate that. Um, also today in the lobby, you're going to see a couple tables. There's one for Teresina. We're still looking for folks to help us uh, for the event, our outreach event uh, on the 14th at Teresina Apartments. And um, so far, I think we've given away or we've been able to provide uh, presents for just about everyone that has asked there. But we're still looking for, for uh, some food sponsors as well as folks to help us at the event itself, right? And also on the 14th, um, you may have heard, this section obviously didn't hear it, but you may have heard on the video announcements that on December 14th, we're having a great uh, gospel choir. It's a laugh banquet is something that usually happens once a month on Fridays, but they have gone ahead and booked a gospel choir for us. They were with us last December and folks, they brought the house down. And we want to encourage everyone to be out on that Saturday night. We've moved that event into Saturday night, 6 bucks. This is the cheapest. You can't buy popcorn at the movies for six bucks, folks. I think the other day someone told me they spent $35 at concessions and that was two drinks, popcorn, and like a Cheez-Its thing or something like that. 35 bucks, right? So six dollars, you're going to have a great meal. The, the, the choir will be off the hook. It'll be amazing, all right? Don't worry, don't worry about, being at a, about it being a quiet evening. It will not be, okay? It will be loud. It'll be fun. Some of you may want earplugs, but it's going to be great. And uh, I'm just telling you, it's going to be amazing. And the whole family can come. We, we would like you to come out for that. And then the final thing is our bags, all our oatmeal bags, that which we're doing to help uh, for Bibles, both for our children's ministry and then for missionary partners around the world, our oatmeal, our still cut oatmeals are here today, and as I mentioned to you last week, these bags are five bucks minimum, but I will take a $10,000 dona- donation for any one of these bags, all right? So thank you very much for those of you in advance that are writing a check for 10000 this morning. Thank you very much. That's what that is, and you'll see those out there on the table today, but please absolutely overpay because... Uh, Remember we talked to you that everyone has an opportunity to participate in Ruin, and this is one of our Ruin ventures, and uh, so everyone could be a part of that. All right, do I have everything? Seems like I'm missing something. I don't know what it is. Oh, it's Thanksgiving, right? How many of you are going shopping this week? Can I see a hand? Really? Really? Do you like it? Do you like, you know, like, now some of you can go as early as like Christmas, or Christmas Eve, you can go Thanksgiving night, right? At the stores, I hear many are opening at like 8 o'clock. And, uh, and you know, I would encourage you, if you're going to go shop, go then, because frankly, you've been sitting around the house all day gorging yourself. So you might as well go out and get some, you know, kickboxing in at the mall or whatever it is that you're going to do, because it's going to be violent. I can almost promise you it's going to be physical, so just take that opportunity. You know, retailers are a little bit worried because stuff is speeding up because Thanksgiving is technically six days later this year, seven days later, and so there are six less shopping days for retailers this year. And so it's going to be a little bit crazy. So welcome to the Christmas and holiday rush. Here we go. And um, I want to talk to you this morning about this idea that nine out of ten can be wrong. There was a clever marketing pattern That continues to this day and it involves uh, toothpaste. The tagline adds the emphasis to the product. Four out of five dentists recommend. You ever see that? Right? Four out of five 
dentists recommend. Now, of course, that's 80%, and that is great consensus on anything today. Can you imagine if Congress had an 80% approval rating in our nation today? They, you know what they've got? They've got the inverted going on. They've got about 19% approval rating and 81 disapproval. So, I mean, they just need to get more dentists in Congress. That's obviously what this is saying, right? But I've learned, I've learned in life that the majority is not always right. In fact, the majority often flies in the face of sound and reasonable decisions. Now, as children, we are taught to be uh, leery of, uh, of the crowd mentality. And the most, ca- the, the most common caution is this one. If everyone, you know where I'm going with this? If everyone jumped in the lake. Now, folks, you know what's funny about this? Obviously, this was a real problem at one time. You see, otherwise, why would they make up a saying, if everyone jumped in the lake, Would you do it too? Obviously, this was an issue. And in my case, I grew up half a mile from a lake, so it was a real possibility in my life. But I never did. I'm proud to say that I resisted the urge of the crowd mentality to go ahead and throw myself headlong into the lake. But I got to tell you that, um, hmm, sometimes the crowd is not only wrong, but what the crowd does can be destructive. Now, it's the week of Thanksgiving, And I'm so thankful for many things like smoke alarms that tell us when our turkeys are done, right? And, uh, and the, sorry, spoken from experience, not my experience. Um, No, 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 that's Pastor Ron. Anyways, uh, the truth is, truth is, is sometimes that we are caught off guard in life. And one of the great alarms that should go off for us as we head into Christmas, as we begin the holiday season, is a very simple one, and it's thankfulness. First Thessalonians tells us, uh, beginning in verse uh, 16 of chapter 5, it says this, Be joyful always. Verse 17, pray continually. And number 18, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is, sometimes people Ask me this question, Pastor Jeff, what is God's will for my life? Give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 17. We're going to spend a little bit of time there this morning. Luke 17, this story of the ten lepers does not show up in any other of the gospel accounts. Leprosy, as many of you know, was a skin disease that required isolation. The uh, Leviticus chapter 13 is dedicated to uh, the procedural confinement, the, the, way, um, the, the, the way leprosy was handled under the law. Now, we don't call it leprosy today. In fact, we call it Hansen's disease. Leprosy continues to, do, to ex- exist. It is a progressive disease, escalating in both physical burden and social stigma. The, 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 the more formal name, Mycobacterium libre, is absolutely curable, though, today. And yet, many, many still continue to live in leper colonies around the world. Now, for the Jews, when they saw those that had leprosy, they believed that they were being punished for a particular sin, and they were being marked above any other sin. And so this mark was, a, was, was God's stamp of displeasure on their lives. Now, interestingly enough, Christ came not only to forgive us of our sin, but he did so much, he, well, he did so much. One of the things that he would do is he would see those that uh, where particular attention was being paid to those, <clears throat> excuse me, that were being marked with this label of sin just because of a sickness or a disease that they carried in their body. John 9, we have the story of the blind man, and people were debating what kind of sin did he uh, what kind of sin did he have that caused blindness in his life? And, and, and the mother spoke of him and said, well, he's been blind since birth. And, 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 and so some of those things. And of course, here in Luke chapter 17, we have a familiar scene to most of us. What I want you to note is the location of this is not given to us. All we know is it's, uh, it's in a border area. And so you have both Jews and Samaritans in the scene And if you found Luke 17, beginning at verse 11, it says this. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, so Jesus is traveling in. 
Uh, Jesus, tra- Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. And they stood at a dis- distance. You know, it wouldn't be hard for the guys that are being shunned to see him first because they were living outside of town. And so they would be the first to see Jesus' arrival. They would be the first to see most people's arrival, by the way. But in this case, Jesus' reputation was going before uh, him, and they were ready. And so they were waiting for Jesus, and they were waiting at a distance. The ten lepers in the group looked out at Jesus and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. You know, I, I, I like that saying, and, and, and most of us immediately translate that their, that their cry is, Jesus, Master, have, uh, uh, give us healing. That is not actually what they're saying. They are saying, have pity on us. They're, they're saying, be lenient on us. Go easy on us, Jesus. That is what they're saying. That's how that is translated out. They aren't actually asking for healing. They're asking for some help in their current situation to ease the frustration, the pain, the stress, the anxiety, everything that goes with the disease that they carry in their body that is very visible to everybody else. So they're not necessarily asking for healing. They're asking what you and I often pray to the Lord. Jesus, please have mercy on me in this situation. Please give me some direction in this. Show me what I am supposed to do. They're praying a very familiar prayer, something that you and I would pray. And in verse 14, when he saw them, he said, Go, show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now, no, it doesn't say, Go and you will be healed, show yourself to the priests. It simply says, Go, Show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Why send them to the priest? Well, first of all, um, this became their test. This became their trial of obedience. Similar to one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament of, of, of Naaman who has to go dip his body in the stinky, smelly Jordan River seven times. I love this story. It's a great story. Could Jesus have healed him uh, in that moment? Of course. Could God have reached down after he had gone under the water one time in the Jordan and, and, and just made his skin as, as white as snow like that of a baby? Sure, he could have. But the fact of the matter is, what we have here is, is a test, is a trial, moving them into obedience. And obedience, I submit to you, was the key to their healing. And Scripture says that they went and as they went, something miraculous happened. I just, <laughs> I just love that God does this kind of stuff. Because can you imagine just walking along and all of a sudden, you, you, you don't have it anymore. It's just gone from your life. Why did Jesus send him to the priest? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. Because he's still working under ceremonial law. It was right for the priest to validate a healing. And so they sent them to the priest so the priest could validate that which was going to happen. Did Jesus know that they were going to be healed on their way? Of course. Of course he did. He spoke it into existence for him. He moved them in that direction. And even though they were just kind of this mishmash of people drawing support from each other, shunned from community, but they had their own little thing going on, they went together and God did something miraculous. Sent to the priest, and the priest declared them clean. And, 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 and I think, you know, in the back of my mind, I, I think, you know, this is the beginning of planting seed in the, in the lives of, of, of the priests that are there to serve God, that, that the Son of Man has come, that, that the, the, the Messiah is here. And here we go, continue with the story. Verse 15 says, One of them, when he saw he was healed, he, he came back, praising God in a loud voice. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm one of those people that when it gets excited, gets quiet. I just kind of, I don't know what to say. There's that social awkwardness when something good happens and I'm just kind of, where other people, you're just, you're just crazy, okay? You just go ballistically nuts. And, and I'm not saying Wanda, but Wanda. And uh, you're, you're, just, you're, you're, you're just crazy, right? And it's, and, and it's fun. I live vicariously through you. And I think, yeah, just like that. That's how I feel, right? And, and yet this one comes back and in a loud voice recognizes um, and praises God. And verse 16 said he, he, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. 
And he was a Samaritan. He wasn't even a part of the tribe, folks. He wasn't even a part of the inner group there. And then Jesus asked a very obvious question. Where? We're, 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 we're not all ten cleansed, right? Where are the other nine? My sarcastic nature says maybe they stopped at Starbucks. It's the first time they've ever been allowed to go in, you know, and everything else. But I suspect that wasn't it at all, that, that all of a sudden they recognized that they were free and they lived free. When it was, was no one found to return and give praise God except this foreigner. Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith. And there's a lot to that word faith. Not just the physical healing, but the spiritual healing of faith and right praise and thanksgiving to the Lord has made you well. So that is the context of thankfulness this morning. And, 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 and there's all kinds of side stories here. But it does prove for me that 9 out of 10 of the majority can sometimes mess things up. <laughs> Collectively, you would think wisdom. You would think that social courtesy would somehow win this scenario, win this scene, but it is obviously lacking in this moment. Now, folks, it is obviously human nature to cry out when we have a significant need in our lives. Oftentimes, it doesn't, uh, it's not even the religious, it's just people in, 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 in general. They say that there is no atheist in a foxhole. When there is a need, we cry out to God. And that is what we see in the beginning of the scene. And I suppose that in God's providence, there are times when suffering is allowed. And it causes us to come to Him. One of the, one of the most difficult questions that people have, and are sometimes afraid to ask, at least publicly, but they, they roll it over in their mind and their heart is this one. God, why? Why, God, is this happening to me? Why, God, is, is all this craziness coming into my life in this moment? And sometimes, when someone does verbalize that my direction, and seeing the, the, the pain and the hurt and recognizing the amount of tears and sorrows that are coming in from that question. I know the answer is sufficient. And yet oftentimes, it's lost on us because of the heaviness of the moment. To tell someone that God has not forgotten them, forgotten them when they feel so forgotten and alone. To say that God is the healer when they're battling sickness in their body and it is ravaging against them to say that God is the source where you just can't seem to make it all come together but it doesn't make the statement any less true that God is able and then when we try to add to that when we try to be God for other people and fix it for them we are not doing them any favors because we have to point them to the one who is the source of not only answers but is the source that brings peace to a situation that is it just doesn't have any peace and i know sometimes we want to make it all better kiss it and, and say okay great go be blessed but sometimes that just seems so hollow and shallow in people's lives but folks hope and thanksgiving and, and and faithfulness and joy and peace exudes from our life even when we don't see what god is doing but when we stand there we are not only an inspiration but we're a testimony of what god wants to do and as we roll into the holiday season where so many people begin to struggle I mean, as a kid, I looked forward so much to the Sears catalog. I'd never ever shopped at Sears in my life, but man, I loved that catalog when it came along, and I just dated myself. But anyways, the catalog would be there, and I would fold pages, and I would do, and I lived with Christmas with hope, but the older I get, I recognize that people hit this season, and it's kind of like, yeah. No. I don't want the holiday. You know, for some folks, some very tragic things have happened in their life this year. And to come into the holidays reminds them of what they do not have. It reminds them of what they are now missing. And it begins to create something in their life that they just have trouble being thankful for. What I know is that God is the Master. He has sent His Son, Jesus. And those things that are in our life are a test and a trial to obedience. 
And we must go show ourselves, reveal ourselves, so that which has been done in our life can be shown as a testimony to His grace. See, we expect God's favor in our lives, but oftentimes we do not want to go about His method or His ways. We just want to say, God, do this for me, and we continue to go on and give no other thought to what God is or who God is in our life. You know what's interesting, folks? These nine out of ten turn out to be an ungrateful bunch. And yet they did not argue with the prescription that God had given them. Go and show yourselves. You know, it's interesting. Leprosy was a very physical, visual disease. The groups would travel and they would have to ring bells or pronounce their arrival or they would always have to be made known because people were very, uh, they just didn't want to be around them. They were lepers and they were treated as such and they were shunned. And so oftentimes, even when they were out, even at a distance, they would try to hide the disfigurement that was going on within their body and everything else. And yet, what does Christ ask them to go do? He asks them to go and show themselves to the priests. He asks them to show themselves. Think of the visual imagery here. They have been so mired, people think they're full of sin, but they know they've just got this physical disease that has been disfiguring fingers and ears and, and their lips and, their, and the marks upon their body that turn into these, that look like scale. It's, it's just a messy disease. And they've spent this whole life trying to hide themselves in public. And now they're to go out into public. And what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to expose themselves. And I submit to you that if we want to be well, we must expose ourselves to the Lord and show ourselves. And it is Him who can pronounce the cleansing upon our lives. But so oftentimes we're trying to hide that which is ugly and terrible in our lives. And sometimes we may not feel the, the shunning, but we do it to ourselves. And to go and show it. Oh, it's a great scene. It's a wonderful scene and makes me think that right here and right here in this moment, that there's some here in this room that desperately need God to move their way. And may I submit to you that if that is you, then Luke 17 is your prescription for what concerns you in this very moment. It, it, the, the, the prescription may seem foolish, obedience, despite that which you see. And for others, it's just completely unnecessary. That's what you think. But I assure you, the longer you wait, the longer that you will continue to struggle and battle the problem. See, I am confident that we can expect God to meet us with the mercy when we are found doing that which he has asked us to do in obedience. I believe in his mercy. I believe in his unmerited favor. So how do you live in that direction instead of following the crowd? Because we've already established that the crowd is not always right. How do, we how do we thrive despite walking sometimes a very lonely road? And you're going to hate this answer? Because I hate when someone gives me the most simple answer in the world. And it's very simply this. Here's how. Be thankful. Oh, you're clapping because you feel like you have to. No, no, stop it. Come on, be thankful. And then it's like, okay, what else? What else? No. Be thankful. Okay, great. Good launching point. Okay. Be joyful. Pray continually. Here it is. And give thanks continually. All things and all times, right? Because this is the will of God for you. No, that's not it. Something else, please. Folks, I, I, there's thankfulness. I, I love this imagery that thankfulness must, must, must come before the gift of Christ at Thanksgiving. We must give thanks in anticipation and hope. And we give thanks for that which is happening in our lives. We may not always like it, but God has seen a way for us to get through it. He has provided a way, and for that we should give thanks. And I have to admit that I want to point a self-righteous finger at the nine and go, you are just a bunch of goofballs. 
How could you mess that up? You've been living ostracized from the community and everything else and all that, and you were so ungrateful, you get healed, and you totally blow this. And then the guy from out of state, he figures it out. He comes in and says, thank you, God. And I submit to you that human nature hasn't changed much, and if the scene was to happen today, I suspect nine out of ten would blow this. The story... This story really demonstrates for us the ingratitude of sin and how easy it is to, to fall into it. If, if, if someone with leprosy can't come and give thanks for the healing that's gone in their life, isn't it probable that if we're not careful that you and I could be guilty of not giving thanks for something that we would deem of lesser value? Of course. Of course. And then what is emphasized in this, and perhaps you didn't note it, but because this was a Samaritan, it's not only a stranger from another country, but it is someone that does not follow their faith. And this is where the alarm goes off loud and clear for me. Not only is the sin of ingratitude common to men, but it's also common with those that consider themselves religious. In other words, sometimes we're an ungrateful bunch. Okay, I know, I know, I know, I get it. I know what the news stations are trying to do. They're trying to make you as grumpy as possible, right? Because if you watch the news for half an hour, I did that for Friday for the first time in months. Oh my goodness, I had to go be with Jesus after that. It was terrible. Man, I'm telling you, and I did a little channel surfing. They, I just figured out they can't figure out what's going on. Right? And I'll tell you, there are a whole bunch of things that we can be freaked out about and be mad about. We can be mad at Congress. We can be mad at the president. We can be mad at Obamacare or the fact that there isn't Obamacare or we can be all this stuff. But may I remind you today that you live in the most prosperous and blessed nation on earth? I was about to say stick that in your pipe and smoke it, but that would be, that would be totally out of line, you see. I would never, ever suggest stuffing a pipe. I think that would be wrong. <laughs> but you get my point. This is an amazing country. And you have been given the freedom to watch crazy news programs that mess up your head. I got to tell you, this is a great place to live. And you're going, have you looked around, Jeff? Folks, if you have traveled any amount in the world, you will recognize how blessed we are. The fact of the matter is, spoiled. Right? Spoiled, 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 spoiled. We are spoiled. <laughs> Some of you are pointing at your children right now. I know, <laughs> I know, but you were spoiled first, so... Because we... Well, I don't know. People doubt now whether we're, we should be called a Christian nation or not anymore, and I'm not getting into that fight right at this moment. The fact of the matter is, so oftentimes, for us as believers, so incredibly blessed to the Lord, you and I have the king of the universe who, who wants to come and give to us make a way, has a plan and a purpose, and we still find room to go. I don't know. It was a very stormy night in 1860 on the waters of Lake Michigan. If you've ever been to the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes appear more like oceans than they do lakes because of their size. Waves and swells can push well over 10 to 15 feet on the Great Lakes. It's amazing stuff. I've been there. I grew up near one. And uh, on this evening, Edward Spencer was walking along the shoreline, and he saw the tragedy happen before his eyes. A crowded steamboat, the Lady Elgin, was rammed by a freighter loaded with lumber. Within minutes, the 393 passengers were thrashing in the water as the steamboat broke apart and sank off 
a mile offshore. The nearest help was, was a ways away in a, in a small village that did not have near the capacity of boats. So Spencer, who swam at his university, he plunged into the water and he began to swim a mile. A mile out and a mile in. And when he went out the first time, he grabbed someone and dragged them to safety. And then he went and he did it again. Seventeen times. He dragged his body until he could possibly not go any longer. Seventeen times, a mile out, a mile in, in waves and storms. And he was responsible for saving 17 lives. 279 other people died that night. And that man became a national hero, acclaimed for his bravery. But he was never able to recover from the emotional shock that he had experienced by seeing so many people die. He was unable to return to the university which he attended. And instead, he was admitted to an asylum. And he kept asking. And he would be sitting muttering, saying this, did I do my best? Did I do my best? A few years later, Spencer, uh, uh, a few years later, he was living now still in that same asylum, and, and he'd become so debilitated, he was now confined to a wheelchair, and an editor of a Chicago newspaper had come across the file and decided that it would be good to see what the follow-up story would be from this young man. And they did not know that he was living in an asylum. And once they figured it out, they sent a reporter to him and he, he showed up on his birthday of all days. And the reporter asked him this question. What was the most vivid memory of that fateful night? And Spencer replied, that not one of the 17 persons that he had rescued said thank you. Folks, being thankful, it gives life. Being thankful not only gives life to us, but it gives life to others. You can research that story, it's true. But I want to assure you that thankfulness is like a giant reset button. See, because thankfulness begins to change our perspective. Thankfulness begins to allow us to see beyond what we're stuck looking at and begin to see what others are doing or, be, or begin to perceive what God is moving in and we get to be a part of that. See, it allows us to see God's perspective when difficulty comes. I assure you, no one lives their life with the desire for difficulty. See, none of you woke up this morning and, and said in your private quiet time with the Lord, saying, God, make this the worst day of my life. <laughs> Did anyone pray that this morning? Because if you do, we have special people to talk to you, okay? <laughs> we really do. But no one wakes up, no one thrives that wants difficulty no one says and is begging that this would be the worst experience that they ever have today and why is that because we don't want difficulty but i want to remind you that difficulty will come and we shouldn't be fearful it as believers but we should be confident that god has not forgotten us and we need to be thankful even in the difficulty but so oftentimes when stuff goes on in our life, we get consumed by it. And I understand, and sometimes things just continue to go on and on and on. But it is still the opportunity to be obedient and go to the master and expose our fears and our concerns and our worries so that we can have his blessing on our life that you are cleansed. And that's the opportunity you and I have today. There are seasons in our life where it's going to seem very dark. And we see no possible way in which to give thanks. And with Thanksgiving here just a few days away, followed up by Christmas, I suspect even some of you today are experiencing pain instead of joy. That you're experiencing some confusion or regret instead of the hope and the life of this season and what it brings. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18. We're going to look at it again. Perhaps you'll consider memorizing these few verses today or writing it on a prominent place in your home or in your car. But it says, be joyful always. Pray 
continually. And the emphasis of our Thanksgiving message today, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Any of you ever read the classic book called The Hiding Place? Any of you ever read that? Corey Ten Boone tells of an incident which taught her the principle of being thankful. She and her sister had just been transferred to Ravensbrück, another German prison camp, and in her recollection, the worst to date. Upon entering the barracks, they found a common theme, overcrowded, but this one wasn't just the fleas, it was the head lice that was just dominant and infested this whole barracks. And that's where they were placed. They weren't allowed Bibles and they weren't necessarily allowed quiet time in their, and, 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 and their time with other prisoners. I mean, there was no sense of privacy and stuff, but somehow a few, a few of the believers found their way to each other and that not having Bibles, they would begin to recite their favorite their favorite prayers and their favorite scriptures together, and they would piece together parts of scripture. And on that morning, they pieced together 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, she would write in her book. About joy, right? About being prayerful. But then this last one, thanks in all circumstances. I suspect it would be hard when you look across at the woman who's sitting next to you and seeing the effects of malnutrition on her body and the diseases that she was likely carrying or the sickness in her, in her, in, in, in her, both in her soul and in herself and then to see the infestation of head lice very visibly before her. And Betsy, Corey's sister, said, You have to give thanks for the lies. Folks, how many times? (laughs) This is so good. This is preaching moment 101 right here. How many times in life? We just don't want to give thanks. to drag it out of you like out of a two-year-old. Just, come on. Come on. Just a little bit of thanks. Come on, just a little. Hey, praise Jesus. Come on. Come on out. We've all been there. And Betsy's going, give thanks for the lice. (laughs) Keeping it real. Give thanks for the lice. I don't know at what point Corey gave in. She says she refused flatly first time out. I will not. I will not give thanks. But her sister persisted as only a sister can do. Finally, she gave in. It was many months later that they figured it out. They they had found uncommon accessibility to people in their barracks, unlike any prison camp they had been in to date. They were able to talk about the love of God. They were able to recite these scriptures together, piece apart. They even said they did. They they, they were able to. F- to piece together large portions of Scripture together because they had all this time. They had never had this any other place. And they realized later what had happened. The guards did not want to come into their barracks because of the head lice. So they just passed it all the time. And it was in those moments in that thing where she recognized that she had to give thanks for the lice. Some of you feel itchy right now, don't you? (laughs) I know, I'm watching you. (laughs) Folks, it's Thanksgiving. 
This week, some of you are going to be sitting across from people you don't even like. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's so true. It's funny. Give thanks. Give thanks. You're going to have a great meal together. You're going to eat stuff you only eat once a year. You're going to eat so much of it that it's going to cause you to sleep in the middle of the afternoon. We know how to give thanks. You and I, this church, we're people of unmerited favor. We meet today in freedom. No one is listening in purposely on this message to find us saying certain things. And if they are, hello? You need Jesus? There you go. But folks, the government doesn't tell us what we can and cannot say. We, ha- we don't have secret police sitting in our audience today waiting for us to trip up and make a mistake and then lock all the doors and then shoot things up and then burn the place down. We have incredible freedom today and we have so much to be grateful for. And as individuals and as church family, we have opportunities before us that we may not like the lice. It never said she liked the lice, but she gave thanks for the lice because it allowed her an opportunity to draw closer to the Lord and that which is placed in her life. We are allowed to say, God, thank you because you are providing a way out for me in this. And so I give thanks. I give thanks and I want to remind you today instead of cursing that which is going on in your life because that is often the first natural reaction to the hardship that we're experiencing. We say terrible things. We say things that that shouldn't be said and, and we begin to mull them over in our spirit and what does it do? It makes us ugly and mean and nasty and everything else but instead what happens when we give thanks? It begins to, it hits that reset button for us and it gets us looking a different way. And I want to assure you that Thanksgiving is a tremendous opportunity. And as we thank God, surrender again to the Master. Be recipients of His favor. Expose yourself to God. Not only will He bless you and others, but He will expand His kingdom. I'm going to ask the worship team to come and find their place. and I'm going to invite you to also pull out this connection card. If you're our guest today, Thank you so much for being here with us. We believe that, um, that there's a need in, in so many of our lives, and one of the things that people most often neglect is their spiritual soul, so I'm thrilled that each and every one of you is here today. And if, if you're our guest, if you're visiting with us, would you just take a moment to fill out that information on the front side? We're not going to show up at your house. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're not even going to call you. Uh, we are going to send you an email, and we're going to send you a letter this week. We, um, we have interest in doing life with you. We, we want to partner with you in your spiritual growth. And so what we're asking is that you would partner back with us. We want to grow together. And so if you would take a moment to fill out the front of that card, that would be great. On the back side of the card, I want to invite you also to take a look at a couple things. Of course, the scan, the QR reader is right there. You can scan that and brings up all the information on the back side of this card. But may I draw your attention to Just a couple things. Tomorrow at 9 o'clock, if you've got some time, when you come back next Sunday, this place is going to look like Christmas. All right? But it doesn't happen with one person. If you can come and volunteer for some few hours with us tomorrow, we'll make coffee, lots of it, and uh, we'll even put on Christmas music. All right? And it'll be a great day. So if you can come and join us about 9 o'clock, 9.30, 10 o'clock tomorrow, that would be great. Okay? Okay? Come on out and see us. But here's your next steps today. I want you to challenge you to memorize by Thanksgiving meal the Scripture verses. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. It's pretty easy. Be joyful. Pray continually. We're halfway there, folks. You fill it out the rest. But give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Easily memorized tougher to apply, but essential, essential to understanding as we move forward in the holiday season. Extra reading, that's my buddy Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5. Seven times he has to go into the Jordan, seven times. You would think after he goes down once it would all be gone. 
Go down twice, you would think progressively stuff would start to disappear. Go down a third time and there's no chain. And you want to give up, you're standing in your whitey tighties in the middle of the Jordan River and your men are all laughing at you. But they're going, keep going, Naaman. Four, five, six. And on the seventh time, if I was him, I would hold it a little bit longer and feel the rushing of the water over my body. And then I would come flying out of the water. In Naaman's case, God healed him. The test was in the obedience. And I submit for you the test of thankfulness leads us and moves us forward in obedience and we begin to see God move in a powerful way. So I encourage you to read the story of Naaman and recognize it. Number one, help me to see life without blinders. You know what blinders are? Anything that you're defensive about or overly protective of. Sometimes those are the blinders in our life. Secondly, allow me to feel deeply the power of thankfulness. There is freedom when you live thankful because everything then feels like a gift from God. But when you begin to live with the entitlement scenario, nothing, nothing is good enough. It always falls short. But thankfulness teaches us it's all a gift from God power to feel that deeply. And finally, practice Thanksgiving beyond this week. You mean have turkey every Thursday and eat too much food? No. But Thanksgiving needs to become a part of our, just who we are, our DNA. You can do that. If you've got those cards, I'm going to ask that you would fill those out. If you're at the end of the aisle, if you'd reach down and grab the bucket. We, we read every one of the prayer requests. We pass those along to our intercessors as well. We respond to those first-time guests and second-time guests, so please mark accordingly. And um, as that comes alongside, an usher's coming down the aisle to pick up those buckets. But I want you to invite you to stand. And as you stand, and as we're being led in song, as many of you have been doing on Facebook the last few weeks, stating all the things that you're thankful for. I think it's one of the best things I've seen on Facebook in a long time, although Mark Miller gave it the best name I've ever heard yesterday. He called it Fake Book, and I think that's great. But I want you just to begin to express your thanks to the Lord. Maybe you're thankful for your spouse that is standing or sitting next to you in this moment, even though this morning you were angry with him or her because they were making you late. Give thanks. Maybe you're thankful that you could drop your kids off and come in here because they were driving you patty. We have so much to be thankful for. As we give thanks, I'm also going to invite my prayer friends to join us here at the front. We'll close this with a closing prayer in just a moment. But let's give thanks together and worship.